Hello friends, Chris here with ISK Recording. In this video, I'm gonna show you step by step how I recorded this song. I'm so glad you've come along. With you I can't go wrong. All my hopes and all my dreams. I recorded this song right here in this living room, nothing fancy about it, using a 2012 13-inch MacBook Pro, the free recording software that comes with every Apple computer called GarageBand a Behringer UMC 404 HD recording interface, and $219 worth of microphones. The total value of everything I used for this recording is $882. I also did this recording right here in this living room. No studio, no room treatment, I didn't bring in any sound panels, just an average living room. This is easily attainable for anybody. Now the first thing I'm gonna talk about is room acoustics. As a general rule, the bigger the better. Now I don't know who started this idea that recording in a closet or in a small vocal booth is going to give you the best sound quality, but that's simply not true. You want as big and open of a space as possible. And if the recording space is carpeted, then that's no good. That carpet's going to soak up all of those high frequencies and it's going to dull in the sound. Although this living room right here, we're looking at about 800 square feet with the rest of the house and uh, 8 foot ceilings. The reason you need a larger space is actually for the lower frequencies, from 400 hertz and down. These frequencies have a really long wavelength and they need a lot of room in order to disperse. If they don't have that room, then they just bunch up and accumulate and you don't really hear it with your ear, but it does have a muddying effect on the lower frequencies of your recording. So you need a large enough space that those low frequencies can just go away, disperse, be gone, disappear forever. So that's why I chose a living room to do this recording because most living rooms just like this one are open to the rest of the house and that gives a larger area for all the sound to disperse and those low frequencies don't become problematic. Now the downside of a living room is it might be close to the kitchen so there could be a fridge humming away and you might also get noise from the furnace of the house. So right now as I'm speaking there's actually a fridge it's plugged in and buzzing away it's about uh, 20 feet away from me. But for this recording I actually did I unplugged the fridge and I turned off the furnace to get as quiet of a space as possible it was dead silent in here. For a recording interface I used a Behringer UMC 404 HD. This is a four channel interface by Behringer and it's got their Midas designed preamps. Now Behringer has two levels of preamps that they use. They've got their Xenix preamps and their Midas design preamps. The Xenix ones are like meh they're so so. You won't get great sounding recordings with them but they'll get the job done it'll be okay. But their Midas design preamps are actually really good. They have a low noise floor and excellent clarity. So this interface has their Midas design preamps and it's a four channel so I can plug four microphones into it and record them simultaneously. Now for microphones we're using the ISK Pro Audio Home Studio Bundle and that bundle gives you four microphones. You get two ISK Vibratos, an ISK DM57 and an ISK BDM1 and a bunch of other knickknacks, some cables and holder and stuff. And it's only $219 and these are fantastic quality microphones. Now the first step in the recording process is to create a ghost track. This is just a rough recording of the song, but it needs to follow perfectly the tempo and the structure of the song. And the purpose of the ghost track is to be played in the headphone monitoring mix of the first artists that are recording, such as the drums and the bass guitar. And this allows them to know where they are in the song so that they know where they're playing a verse, where they're playing a chorus, where to put their fills for the drummer. And then the ghost track just gets deleted after your drums and bass guitar are recorded. So the ghost track doesn't need to be a high quality recording and it doesn't need to incorporate all of the parts. Generally what I like to have for a ghost track is just the rhythm guitar and lead vocals. So to create the ghost track the first thing you need to do is get the tempo of the song. And once you have that tempo and the click track is set then just record your rhythm guitar parts and your vocals over top of that. Okay now we're on step two. We're micing the drum kit. For overheads we used a pair of ISK vibrato microphones. Now the most ideal placement for these microphones while recording is actually right where the drummer's nose is. But, because the drummer needs to be there, he's kind of in the way of the ideal microphone placement. So, I place him as close as I can to that location, which is right above his head. And then we placed a microphone on the snare. We used an ISK DM57. It's pointed down at about 45 degree angle, pointed towards the drummer, and placed about two inches away from the top of the snare. And we put a mic on the kick drum, we used the ISK BDM1. And this isn't rocket science, just stick the mic in the hole, and that's where it'll sound great. Now step three, you gotta set your recording levels. Your recording interface will have preamps and you need to dial in the right amount of gain so that it's not too quiet but also not too loud. Although there's a fairly wide buffer zone, as long as you're within that zone it doesn't have to be too precise. The only one rule is don't clip. And what clipping means is you've got the signal level set too hot that it'll clip the top of the waveforms. And you can tell just by looking at it. 
So here's an example of what the waveform looks like within its region when it's recorded in GarageBand software. This example is an ideal recording level. Now right here, in this example, this is too loud. You can see the top and bottom of the waves, that they're flatlined. I've got the volume set too high that it's not able to fit the entire wave in that small region, and so it clips the top and bottom of the wave. That's why it's called clipping. When this happens, it'll give you noticeable distortion, and there's no way to fix it. So make sure when you set your gain that you have a comfortable amount of space there, so that if the artist goes louder than you expected, he's still not going to clip. When looking at these regions, you want to set your gain so that your peaks, and your peaks are like the loudest parts, these little peaks in the waves, you want your peaks to be anywhere from using 25% to 75% of the space in that region. That gives you a comfortable amount of headroom so that if they go louder, it's still not going to clip, but it's loud enough that you're not going to get noise induced from recording at too quiet of a level. Now a lot of people take this concept and they think, okay, lower levels means higher noise floor. And that's simply not true unless you're in the range of extremely low levels, like you wouldn't even see the waveform in the region. So don't worry about trying to set your gain as high as possible without clipping. A lot of people do that and it's just unnecessary because you're taking extra risks that you might clip. So here's an example of a waveform where the peaks are hitting at about 25% of the space available. And here's an example where the peaks are hitting at about 75% of the space available. So set your recording level so that the size of your waveform is somewhere in between these two. Step four, prepare your drummer's headphone monitor mix. Okay, this part is crucial. Your drummer absolutely needs to hear the click track louder than anything else, way louder than anything else. This is because it's hard for the drummer to hear the click track. See, the click track is a percussive sound. Tick, tick, tick. And the drums that he's playing are also percussive sounds. So the drums camouflage the click track and make it very difficult for the player to differentiate between the click and the drums that he's actually playing. And then what happens is he sways from the click track and every once in a while he'll catch it again and go back on time. So he'll have these little tempo fluctuations and those tempo fluctuations will actually sound fine when you listen to the drums by themselves, but when you add all the other instruments in, it's going to be noticeably off time. So to overcome this issue, the click track needs to be overwhelmingly louder than everything else the drummer hears. But the challenge with that is the acoustic drum kit is really loud by itself, and the sound from it is going to travel through the headphones and into the drummer's ears. He's going to hear that drum kit acoustically. So to overcome that, you have to make the click track in the headphone monitoring mix extremely loud to the point where it's making that poor drummer's ears bleed. And that's the amateur way of doing it. But I'm going to show you a better way. Now to keep the budget low on this recording, I went to the dollar store and picked up some dirt cheap earbuds. These were four dollars. Now I was careful to select a type that are noise isolating. So if you're not listening to music through them, you could just put them in and they'll deaden the sound around you just like an earplug. And that's important because you want to get isolation from the outside environment. So your drummer's going to hear his headphone monitoring mix through these earbuds. And because the earbuds are so small, you can put construction earmuffs on top of them. And that gives you extremely good noise isolation so that you don't have to crank the volume. And if you don't want to use $4 earbuds, there are better earbuds on the market um, with even better sound isolation. I personally would recommend any of the earbuds by Etymotic Research. They have excellent sound quality and extremely good sound isolation. So once you've got that click track set, it's still going to be pretty loud in his ears, but not blasting loud. The second loudest part in the drummer's headphone monitor mix is going to be the ghost track. It's going to be substantially quieter than the click track. And remember, it's only there so that he knows where he is in the song. And then the third thing that the drummer's going to hear in his headphone monitoring mix is his own playing. You probably don't even have to dial any of that in. He'll hear himself a little bit acoustically, and that should be enough. Now step five. Once the drums are recorded, the rest of the order of recording things isn't as crucial, although I do prefer to start with the bottom and work my way through the rhythm section first. So after drums, I'd recommend recording bass guitar. In his headphone monitoring mix, he's going to hear the drums, which were just recorded, he's going to hear the click track, and he's going to hear the ghost track. Now to record the bass guitar, just take your guitar cable and plug it into the DI input of the recording interface and record it direct. For bass guitars, this will always give you the best sound quality, especially in the lower frequencies. See, low frequencies don't really have any tone to them. The tone comes from the higher frequencies. So you want to get that really clean recording for the low frequencies. Now every once in a while, you'll get a bass guitar player that loves the sound of his amp and he's going to argue with you on this because he's going to want to mic his cab, but you're not going to get as clean of low frequencies if you do that. 
So when that happens, the first thing you need to do as a recording engineer is try to convince this bass guitar player that it's for the overall good. You need to record the DI signal. If they persist and they really insist that they want to mic their cab, then what you need to settle on is still recording the DI signal, but what you can do is reamp to record his cab, and then you have both. You have the DI and you have the sound of his cab. And in the mixing process, you can blend them together and get the best of both worlds. All right, step six. Now we've got drums and bass guitar recorded. The next part that I would generally record would be the rhythm guitar parts. I would do multiple takes, layer them up, and then I would do vocals, and then I would do lead guitars, and then I would do harmonies, and then I would do any additional supplemental parts. You made all my dreams come true. The first time that we met. And then once you have all of the individual tracks recorded and you've layered it up to make up the entire song, we're on to step seven. Boom, mixing and mastering. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, recording, that's the easy part. Mixing and mastering, that takes a long time and a lot of money worth of equipment to do a really good job of. Now I'm gonna be creating a lot of videos on mixing and mastering and techniques that you can use. Plus you can download this GarageBand session and see how I mixed and master it, reverse engineer it, play with it, tinker, and maybe you can even make it sound better than I did. Also, ISK Pro Audio offers mixing and mastering services at very reasonable rates. Now I did two mixes of this song. For the second version, I brought the session into the studio and mixed and mastered it there with the higher quality plugins, conversion, and I use analog summing too, which I really like the sound of. So here's a quick little comparison of the two mixes. I've been waiting for so long For someone to come along For so long For someone to come along I never knew it would be you Together we can see it through I've been waiting for so long For someone to come along I never knew it would be you Together we can see it through For so long For someone to come along I never knew it would be you Together we can see it through And there you go, that's all there is to it. You see, recording a song really isn't hard. Anybody can do it. And over the last decade, there's been such huge improvements in the technology that even low-cost gear can have really good sound quality if you buy the right low-cost gear and you know how to use it. Those two things are crucial. The right low-cost gear and know how to use it. If you want a microphone with a fancy brand name, well that's fine, but you'll be paying a hefty premium for that. If you just want to get a microphone that has great sound quality and costs as little as possible, you need to check out ISK microphones. They're probably the best bang for the buck microphones in the world. So if you found this video helpful, please return the favor. Hit that like button right down there. Boom. Thumbs up. Like. Smash it. And make sure you subscribe to this channel because I've got tons more videos coming.